difference between letting go and controlling. If you can really understand that, meditation is easy. People try that and they think, I'm letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go. But they're not letting go. They're still controlling. What they're doing is they're saying, let go. Come on, you're going to let go. Let go, let go, let go, let go. That is just another type of controlling. It's doing things. Real letting go is very difficult. Because you have to go out of the way. You have to disappear. And then letting go happens. Which is why that if you understand anatta, non-self, then you'll be able to let go. So, because it's difficult, we have these stages of letting go. All the stages of meditation which I teach are just what happens when you let go. When you abandon, when the mind becomes peaceful as you let go little by little, as you abandon, as you renounce, these are the natural stages of the mind. In the same way that when you go on a journey, you pass this village and that forest. It's just what happens when you go on a journey. And the thing is, you say, do you have to pass that intersection? Do you have to pass that forest? Do you have to pass that village? Of course you do. It's just part of the journey, that's all. And those signposts which are on the journey to deep meditation are these. It's present moment awareness where time disappears. It's silence where the mind stops thinking. It's taking up one thing, your meditation object, the first stage of one-pointedness, just on one thing. And that one thing becomes happy as your body starts to disappear. Abandoning the body, abandoning the five senses as you come to your first encounter with your mind as a brilliant light. And then eventually abandoning the control of the doer to get into the jhanas. We go in, in, in. And as you be able to feel yourself just going in as you do this, the simile which comes from the Hindu tradition of meditation, and it's supposed to be in the Bhagavad Gita, but I read that some years ago and I couldn't find it. It's supposed to be there somewhere. It's of the teacher who had three students and he would taught the students to meditate using the art of archery. Some of you heard this simile before, but please listen again because it will reinforce an important aspect of meditation. What I mean by going in. The master taught these three students great feats of marksmanship by telling them to concentrate and be still, teaching them samadhi. And to give them a test, he took a stuffed bird, like a doll, but looking like a bird, and put it on a tree, on a branch, a long way away. And he gave the bow and arrow to his first student, and gave him the task of shooting that bird, not anywhere, but through the left eyeball. Even the right eyeball would not be good enough. To be able to do that was a, a huge feat of archery. Have you ever seen these Zen practitioners? who on horseback going very, very fast, not even holding on to the reins, could shoot an arrow as they rush past and get it right in the centre of a target. It's an incredible feat to see. And this was a similar feat, to shoot a bird through the eyeball such a long way away. And he gave the bow and arrow to the first student and said, that's the task, make yourself one with the target, take as long as you like, but before you release the arrow, give me a sign. I want to ask you a question. So the first student focused, focused on the left eyeball of the bird. And when he thought he was concentrated enough to shoot, he gave the master a sign. And the master said, can you see the bird on the tree? Yes, master. Stupid student, <laughs> said the master, and pulled the bow and arrow away. Go and learn some more meditation. He didn't know what he'd done wrong. 
But the bow and arrow was given to the second student. Same instructions. Make yourself one with the target. I want you to shoot the arrow through the left eyeball. But before you shoot, give me a sign. And this student, he meditated and concentrated for one whole hour. And then he gave the master a sign. And the master asked the same question. Student, can you see the bird on the tree? What tree? said the student. The master smiled. He was interested. Can you see the bird on the tree? You can't see the tree. Can you see the bird? Oh yes, master. Stupid student. (laughs) And he pushed the student away, grabbed the bow and arrow, told him to go off and meditate some more and he gave it to the third student. Same instructions. One with the target. Concentrate as long as you like. Before you shoot, give me a sign. And this student just stood there for two long hours focusing and concentrating. And when he was ready to shoot, he gave the teacher a sign. Can you see the bird on the tree, said the master. What tree, said the student. The master smiled. Can you see the bird? What bird, said the student. The master smiled even more. Well, what can you see? All I can see, master, is one eyeball. (laughs) Ah, said the master, fire. And he released the arrow. And because that was the only thing he could see, that was the only place the arrow could go. It was a dead hit. It wasn't a bull's eye, it was a bird's eye. (laughs) God, that's a joke. And so, <laughs> and so you've got a bird's eye, not a bull's eye. So, the moral of that story is to show what happens when we focus with, with stillness on an object. You focus, if you're looking at me, after a while you won't see Mangala sitting next to me. You won't even see the Buddha behind me. You won't even see the microphone to my right. If you focus, all that's on the outside starts to disappear and all that's left is what is in the center. The nature of the mind is to focus. And if you don't believe me, look at the more modern simile of the television. And if you understand this simile, you can save many thousands of ringgit. When you watch a TV, When you first switch it on, what do you see? You'll be able to see the photo of your maybe grandmother on top of the television. You'll be able to see the magazines underneath, the flowers to the side, or whatever else you've got on the outside of that television when you first switch it on. But as you focus because of interest in what's going on in the screen, you'll find that all that's on the periphery will soon disappear from your conscious awareness. In fact, after a few seconds, even the edges of the screen will disappear. You will not be conscious of whether it's a wood panelled television on the outside, a metal or whatever it is. Even if you had a diamond shaped screen or a circular screen, it wouldn't matter. After a while you wouldn't see that. I've sat on these aircraft and they've got these tiny screens. It doesn't matter if you've got a tiny screen or a big, you know, three foot, six foot plasma screen. After a while, it all looks the same. Small screen TV or a huge screen TV. Once you focus in, the mental experience is identical. Check it out and see. Next time you go on an aircraft and there's one of these uh, little screens in front and there's a movie on. Check it out, look at it. Such a small screen. But after a while the mind focuses in and it fills the whole mind in much the same way as a huge movie screen in one of these multiplex complexes. So, it's a waste of money buying these huge plasma screen TVs. 
Because it actually looks exactly the same when you're watching. You can actually buy a tiny screen and your experience is exactly the same and you can save more money to give to Chempaka Buddhist Lodge. <laughs> but the point is that this is what happens when we focus. We go into the center. When you start focusing, you start first of all going into the center of what? Into the center of time. Into the now. Sometimes that people work to get into the present moment, but you know it's going to happen naturally. Just working, just they're trying to bring your mind back from the part, from the future, bring it uh, back from the, the past, putting it in the present moment. It will ha- happen naturally after a while. But nevertheless, focus into the center of time, into the now. That's the only place where things are happening. All the rest is either fantasy or uncertain ideas of what happened in the past. Anybody who has spoken to, say, traffic cops would know that even two people, even you, if you saw a traffic accident and they asked you things like, what was the colour of the car? Half the time you'd get it wrong. Even what lane it was in and what happened Two people or three people give three different accounts of what happened, even though you saw it. Even the memory of a short time ago is very uncertain. Where did you put your shoes before you came in here? Even what you ate for breakfast, are you really sure that was what you ate? We think we're sure, but sometimes we're wrong. And that's only this morning. What about last week? Earlier on? Look, the past is just so uncertain. We get it wrong again and again and again. That's why we have arguments about who said what or who did what. The future is also incredibly uncertain. There's one of those stories in my book about fortune tellers. Some people especially people in Malaysia like to go to fortune tellers. And one of my sayings is never trust a poor fortune teller. <laughs> it makes sense. If you're going to go to a fortune teller, go to a rich one. If they can't tell their own fortune, how can they tell yours? <laughs> and this story is one day when somebody asked my teacher, Ajahn Chah, to tell his fortune. Now, good monks of our tradition are not allowed to tell fortunes, even though that some monks have got great psychic abilities. It's against our rules. But this man decided to push his luck. He went up to the great teacher, my master Ajahn Chah, who did have great psychic powers, and asked him, please tell my fortune. He said, well look, we don't do that. He said, now listen, I've given so many donations to this monastery. I fed you for so many years. In the first days when no one knew you, it was me who looked after you more than anyone else. I even abandoned my family and business to drive you around. Surely you owe me some debt of gratitude. The least you can do, because I know you can do this, the least you can do out of gratitude. You teach us to be grateful. Now you be grateful to me. Read my palm. And of course, it was one of those requests a monk finds it very hard to refuse. Because it was true, the man had really sacrificed himself. So Ajahn Chah said, Okay, I will make an exception. This was the only time my master read the lines on somebody's palm to tell him his fortune. And it was incredible how accurate Ajahn Chah was and how what he predicted actually came true. It's amazing. He took his palm and Ajahn Chah started with his finger, started tracing the lines. 
very slowly. And of course the man was getting very excited. He knew that whatever Ajahn Chah saw must be correct because he was a great monk. Ajahn Chah would never lie. And every now and again he would trace the, the, the lines with utter concentration and say, wow, look at that. Oh, that's interesting. Mmm. And this man was getting more and more excited. He couldn't wait to find out what Ajahn Chah had seen. And then when Ajahn Chah was finished, this man couldn't help himself and say, yes, what can you see, sir? And Ajahn Chah said, now listen, I never make mistakes. Yes, I know, but what can you see? And whatever I tell you is going to be true. Yes, 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 get on with it. And Ajahn Chah gave his prediction, which was absolutely right, as it turned out. He said, sir, having looked at your palm, having used my powers, your future, sir, is uncertain. <laughs> and Ajahn Chah was right. <laughs> it was a perfect... <laughs> With the point of that story, if he'd have just said, look, we can't predict the future, it's uncertain, no one would have believed him. But when he went through that object lesson and made it very funny and gave many of his disciples like me a story they can tell their own disciples, it made a very strong and powerful point that you cannot predict the future. So why do we expect something to happen? Why do we want something to happen? Why do we say in our meditation, or you ask the teacher, what should I do next? In meditation there is no next. There is no future. Only now. The future is uncertain. That's what Ajahn Chah said. Absolutely uncertain. So, throw it away. You can't do anything about it. All your craving and will, trying to get into deep meditation in the future, wanting insight to happen next, trying to get into jhana or whatever, is all trying to control the uncertain future. Now, we let go completely of what's going to happen next. Instead, we attend to what's happening now. Who cares about the future? You can't predict it, completely uncertain. You could be enlightened in the next moment, but the chances are you'd be just as stupid. But whatever you do about it, in fact, if you do anything about it, it makes it worse. So stop predicting the future. Or just stop. What do we mean by stop? It means we're not going anywhere. Very often, you're going somewhere. You're supposed to be on this retreat. But many of you are going somewhere. You're going off into the future, you're going off into the past, you're going off into expectations, you're going off into fantasies, going anywhere except stopping where you are. No expectations, present moment awareness is all about stopping. Who was one of the most unlikely of people to become enlightened in the time of the Buddha? Angulimala. A serial killer who was running after the Buddha. And how did Angulimala become enlightened? The Buddha said, stop. What do you mean stop? Stop. Nanguni Mala stopped. He wasn't just running after the Buddha, the physical Buddha. He was running after enlightenment. Are you running after the Buddha? Do you know what I mean? Meditating, I'm running after enlightenment, running after jhana, running after bliss, running after... If you're running after the Buddha, it's called craving, desire. In your meditation, you'll find, yeah, you're running. You're running somewhere. You're running after the Buddha. And the Buddha sometimes turns around and says, Stop! 
If you stop running, you're in the present moment. 